So I have the opportunity to talk about the promise of, of imaging myocardial blood flow reserve with SPECT. This is an exciting area that we've been involved in for about the last five to six years, and we're finally, I think, showing promise with this. These are my disclosures. So my objectives are first to comment on the clinical utility of measuring blood flow reserve using rubidium PET. And it's clearly been shown there's incremental value of adding MFR to rubidium PET. I'm sure Dr. DiCardi will go into that in, into greater detail. And it's the success of MFR that with, that it, with rubidium PET that makes it very uh, attractive to us using SPECT to add MFR as well. So MFR is possible with SPECT using solid state detectors. We've done one preclinical study validating the technique, and there have been several clinical studies also validating the technique. Then I want to talk about what are the next steps. It's early days measuring blood flow with SPECT, and we need more validation. I'm going to start with a case. This is actually a pet case. An 82-year-old female uh, in our lab in May of this year who had definite angina, dyspnea. She had a positive diprotomal ECG test with angina. These are her images. And there's a very small area of reduced perfusion in the, the apical infralateral wall. Something you could write off or you could call a small area of ischemia. These are our blood flow pictures. If you look at the rest flow, first the rest flow is high. It's 1.27, normal is about 0.8. She has systolic hypertension, a blood pressure of 200, and a heart rate of 70. So that explains the high rest perfusion. Then with stress, her heart rate went up, her blood pressure went down. She definitely had a diprotomal effect, but her flow went down. It went down to 1.07. So this shows that her flow was being driven by her systemic pressures. And then you looked at reserve. Reserve was markedly decreased. You look at delta, the difference between stress flow and rest flow markedly decreased. So it's the flow here that showed you that this patient had severe impairment of her, of her uh, flow reserve. And what she has on angiography is a severe left main stenosis. So this is an example of MFR adding to relative perfusion imaging and identifying a patient with truly balanced ischemia. So MFR was essential in this patient to actually identify the severity of her disease. So it would be very attractive to be able to add this to our SPECT imaging. So measurement of MFR with PET does improve diagnosis and prognosis. The problem is there's not much PET imaging available. In Canada, we're essentially the only site doing cardiac PET. In the US, Manny just showed that about 5% of studies are actually being done with PET. Data that I had showed that SPECT was available with about 98% of studies throughout North America being done with SPECT. So MFR measured with SPECT would be a significant advance for SPECT imaging. Now fortunately, there have been developments that make imaging of flow reserve possible, and the, this is the development of solid state SPECT cameras. These uh, cameras use cadmium zinc telluride detectors these are very small detectors, much smaller than sodium iodide detectors. They have better intrinsic spatial resolution. And the real plus of these detectors is how small they are. The small size allows the development of novel gantry designs. And it's the gantry design that results in the increased photon sensitivity. About a five-fold increase in photons for a given radiation dose. Plus, the detectors are stationary, or relatively stationary. They don't rotate around like two-headed cameras, so your temporal resolution is much better. There are two vendors making these cameras. GE Healthcare makes the NukeMed 530C and Spectrum Dynamics DSPECT. The hardware also comes with better software, improved reconstruction algorithms that use OSIM. This allows you to have various corrections like resolution recovery and also CT-based corrections. Bottom line is you have better images from low count data. And this is particularly helpful if you want to measure blood flow. So this is an example of a pig study. This is a study done by Glenn Wells, our SPECT physicist. This is data that was acquired in list mode over 11 minutes, then rebinned for these time intervals you see here. Initially, you can see the tracer in blood pool of the RV right atrium. 
eventually in blood pool of the RV and the LV, and then finally out in the myocardium. This is a pig model where the patient had an LED stenosis, which is why you have the apical defect. So these are dynamic images. You can place regions of interest over the uh, images. So you can see here an LV region. You can do the same thing in the left atrium or in the left ventricle. This allows you to get time activity curves just like what we get with PET. So this is time, activity. In red, we have the arterial input function, which is the activity measured in the left atrium or left ventricular cavity. You have myocardial activity shown in the dark blue. And then in the light blue, you have the modeled myocardial uptake. You get data out like uptake we're familiar with, but also a K1 map. And the K1 map is an estimate of flow. So in this model, the pig had a suture around the LED, which was tightened to create an LED stenosis. The pig was also given dipritamol. And you can see with stress, uptake a defect here like you'd expect, and also an area of reduced flow uh, in the K1 map. So this is the data that was published by uh, Dr. Wells, where we show the comparison of, of flow, blood flow measured with CZT using thallium, using tetraphosphan, and system maybe all compared to microspheres. And the correlation is very good, 0 0.83, 0 0.76, 0 0.77. So in a pig model, a ventilated model, you can demonstrate a, a very good correlation between blood flow with microspheres versus CZT. Now there have been several human studies. This is the first study done by Dr. Ben Heim in collaboration with Dr. DeCarli, who's the next speaker. They looked at 95 patients with known or suspected CAD. Of these, 16 underwent coronary angiography. They used Sestamibi and the Spectrum Dynamics camera. They calculated a, an index of flow reserve, which was stress K1 divided by rest K1. They divided the patients to, into those who had normal or abnormal scans, and then looked at the, the global flow reserve in the patients with abnormal scans, it was less than that in patients with normal scans. Then they looked at the subgroup of patients who had angiography, divided the regions that were supplied by an obstructed artery versus a, a normal artery, and again, flow reserve on a regional basis was decreased in the regions with an obstructed artery. So this shows for the first time that you could estimate global and regional flow with a solid state camera. The next important study was by bois Leg in France, where they looked at 23 patients who had multivessel disease. These patients underwent coronary angiography and also FFR. They used Sestamibi and they used the GE Healthcare Nucleid 530C. So this first graph shows the relationship between stenosis and regional flow reserve. And you can see that regional flow reserve decreases with increasing stenosis. This graph looks at fractional flow reserve as fractional flow reserve decreases, so does regional flow. Now this is an important study. This is one of two studies comparing CZT spec versus PET flow. PET flow is the gold standard uh, for measurement of myocardial blood flow. So this is by Nicolou from uh, Phil Kaufman's group in Zurich. 28 patients, they measured MFR with Sestamibi and the GE camera, compared that to PET with ammonia. They did no corrections for the differences in retention. And what you can see here is flow with PET versus uh, CZT with the roll-off. And the roll-off you expect because of the differences in retention for varying flows. But what this did show is uh, myocardial uh, blood flow measurement is feasible with CZT spec and correlates with ammonia PET. It also so shows the need to correct for varying retention. And that's what we did in this study published by Glenn Wells, our physicist. He took patients and imaged them with tetraphosphan and CZT versus rubidium PET measured with a PET CT and did the appropriate corrections for varying retention for both tetraphosphan and for rubidium. If you look at the tetraphosphan data, this is the arterial input function, the myocardial region data. It's noisy compared to the PET data. The PET data is more counts, so you have smoother curves. If you look at the maps, uptake is very similar, more contrast in the PET data, again, to the better counts. You look at the K1 map, again, the defect is very similar. 
So this is a patient who had significant LED disease with very similar polar maps for tetraphosphomyces at T versus rubidium with PET. We did correlations in 31 patients with CZT, with tetraphosphamine, PET with rubidium or ammonia. We corrected blood flow for varying extraction fractions. We did this with AC and no AC. So we used the AC from the PET CT to correct the CZT data. And this is PET flow versus SPECT. You can see the correlation was very good, 0.85 with AC and similarly with no AC. So that was a bit surprising, but probably does make sense in that the attenuation of blood pool and of the myocardial activity would be similar. And this is also very good in the sense that most CZT cameras do not come with AC. So the fact that we can measure global myocardial blood flow accurately with or with AC makes it easier to implement. We also looked at global myocardial blood flow reserve, which is stress divided by rest. The correlations are less good, 0.6, 0.6, and this is because of more noise in the data by adding the rest flow. So bottom line, myocardial blood flow with CZT spec correlates well with rubidium PET. This is the protocol we've developed for clinical use. Patients get, patients get a rest injection, dynamic acquisition for 11 minutes. It looks like we can actually decrease the dynamic acquisition to, acquisition to about nine minutes, and then the usual static uh, gated acquisition this rest acquisition is later used to correct the stress data for any residual activity from the rest injection. The patient gets diprinamol in our lab. We're collaborating with other sites that use other stressors, which appear to give similar results. Dynamic acquisition, then a later static gated acquisition. We're looking at the possibility of using the later aspects of the dynamic acquisition instead of having to acquire the later static gated acquisition. So this is a patient who has a diagonal branch that has a significant narrowing. Uh, rest was very normal. Stress, you can see a small area of blood flow impairment and also on the uptake map. So to conclude, MFR has been very helpful with PET imaging, improves diagnosis uh, and also prognostication. So it would be very desirable to have MFR with SPECT imaging. And it looks like MFR with CZT SPECT is possible. We validate it in a clinical model. We and others have shown good correlation with angiography, with FFR and PET. So we're at the point where we need more data. We need to see how feasible it is to implement this into routine labs. It's more complicated than usual SPECT. SPECT imaging is a very straightforward procedure. So we're adding another complication, which is additional imaging. So we plan a feasibility study this fall to see what is the cost of implementing this into a busy lab? Then we're planning a multi-center study which will look at the incremental diagnostic value of MFR compared to relative perfusion imaging for determining diagnostic accuracy and also for prognostication. Great, thank you for your attention.